Hello, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to the Long and McQuaid Learning Series. We are broadcasting live here from uh, our Yamaha Canada uh, headquarters here in Toronto. My name is Ryan Hamilton and I'm the product manager for, uh, for drums, for Yamaha Drums. And we are thrilled to, uh, to be uh, helping, co-sponsoring Long and McQuaid with this uh, really exciting uh, you know, learning series installment. Uh, today, of course, we are featuring uh, my good friend behind me here, the, uh, the incredible Mr. Larnell Lewis. Um, Larnell, if you haven't uh, seen him before, you're in for a treat. If you have, you, you, know what you're, uh, you know what you're in for, which is gonna be something special. Uh, Larnell is a Grammy-winning um, performer, uh, composer, producer, uh, drummer extraordinaire. Uh, you know, he, he, he reached critical acclaim uh, with his Grammy with the band Snarky Puppy and uh, you know, teaches here in Toronto at, at Humber, and we're thrilled to be uh, affiliated with him and associated with him, so uh, I think everyone is, is gonna really enjoy uh, the uh, getting organized behind the drum set uh, lesson installment here today. So enjoy, I hope everyone is safe, uh, take care, and without further ado, Mr. Larnell Lewis.
<laughs> oh, wow, wow, wow. Welcome, everybody. I'm your host, Larnell Lewis, and I'm very excited to be here. I wanted to, first of all, thank you all for showing up. I greatly appreciate it. And I also want to thank Long and McQuaid and Yamaha Canada for making this happen. Uh, it's always a pleasure to find interesting ways to connect with the community. And so, from me to you, thank you all. Today, we're going to be talking about getting organized. Now, what does that mean? Simply put, we often get behind this instrument or in front of this instrument with lots of passion, lots of burning, burning passion and energy. And we don't know what we want to do. We get, you know, get at the snare, we get at the toms, we get at the cymbals, and uh, we might end up recording a song, might play a cover online. And you don't feel as excited as you did once you listen back. Once you hear everything that you had done, you, kind of, you might not even be motivated to continue playing. And um, I completely understand that, and I will say that that is normal. It's absolutely normal. We are in the practice of learning how to music, learning how to express, using this voice to convey our thoughts and feelings. But before we just get to the top of the mountain and start yelling, we got to understand some grammar. We got to understand how to organize our thoughts. Um, you know, you ever tell a joke and you put the punchline before you tell the rest of the joke by accident? Yeah, we're going to try and correct that today. So if you uh, don't mind joining me on this journey, we're going to talk about three main pillars. Okay? We're going to talk about sounds. We're going to talk about songs. And we're going to talk about soloing. Now, we don't have much time together, but I also noticed that uh, everybody is commenting and uh, joining in the conversation. And so feel free. I'm seeing your questions. I'm seeing what's going on. The amazing team here has got me locked into you. So be nice, but also be curious. And make sure you just say what you need to say. This is our safe space, and I'm here to guide and help you. Sounds. I got a lot of sounds with me. Um, and you probably saw me use almost every single one of them. So let's go through it quickly. Today I'm using the Stage Custom Hip Yamaha Kit. It is a 10 inch tom, a 13 inch tom snare, eh, eh, eh. and also a 13, I think that's a 13 by 8, a 13 by 4 inch snare drum as well as the main snare, and of course a 20 by 8 inch bass drum. Now you're probably wondering, uh, what's a big dude like you doing behind, you know, a kit like this? Well, first of all, I like the color, okay? So get that straight. Second of all, <laughs> um, I wanted to explore the sounds. Uh, this is my second time getting an opportunity to play and work with this drum kit, and I'm really looking forward to pushing it to its limits. So let me know what you know, or let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know how you feel about the sounds. Again, I'm seeing some of the questions, and I will be getting to some of them very shortly. Um, for my cymbals, Zildjian, of course, I want to thank them. I'm using a 20-inch Cluster Crash. I'm using a 22-inch K Constantinople Medium Thin Low. I'm using a 19-inch K Custom Special Dry Trash Crash with two rivets. All right, we'll get into that in a second. Somebody asked about stacks. I don't know where you are, Justin. I hope you're still watching. We're going to talk about the stacks right about now. So I have here with me a 10-inch stack. This stack, two symbols. You'll see why I'm being very specific. On top is the trash former, okay, ZHT trash former, 10 inch. And on the bottom is an A custom EFX splash. To my right, the main event. That's probably the one you want to know about, Justin. This is a combination of three symbols. On top, I have a K EFX 16 inch. On the bottom, I have a 14-inch K, sorry, a 14-inch Oriental China Trash. And in the middle, I have a 12-inch Gen 16 Splash. And uh, I love the way this combination sounds. I actually put it together in a rush. 
Um, not the band. Uh, we'll get into more of that stuff a little bit later as well. And um, tw of course, I'm using 14 inch um, K Constantinople hi hats. My heads, I'm using G1 on my rack toms, and I'm using a UV1 on my main snare. Typically, I use an EQ3 on my kick as well, clear. And for the electronics, this, I believe that uh, Jacob, S. Jacobs, was asking about this. He wanted to know what are the three pads off to my left, so it's actually one complete unit with 12 zones on it, and this is called a DTX Multi-12. I love this. Um, instrument because I'm able to do so many different things. The piece that you heard me play on that is actually a solo piece that I had done on my previous records, the latest one being Relive the Moment, and you can check that out. And um, I can play a lot of melodic stuff, I can play percussion instruments, but the awesome thing about it is that you can not only import samples, but you can play multiple sounds per pad, which is why I was able to get so many melodic options. Again, talking sounds. More cowbell. This is, um, I believe, the LP-225 Cowbell. I'm in love with this. Thank you, LP. And uh, I'm using Promark drumsticks. These are the Rebound 5A Fire Grain sticks. Did I leave anybody out? Of course, I did. The Yamaha EAD-10. This is actually a stereo sensor that's sitting on my bass drum right now. I do have a pedal that I'm using to trigger the delay effect that you're hearing right now. And actually here on my rack tom is a DT50S. It's a dual trigger, acoustic drum trigger. And I have it on here because I'm able to set up tap tempo. Right? And that controls the speed of the delay. You probably saw a few other toys that were floating around. I have to have some chimes, right? Some seeds. Okay. And at some point, I'll probably use the shaker as well. So that is the overall of my sounds. Now, when we talk about these three main pillars and we're talking about sounds, we're talking about understanding what you have. Talk about understanding short, medium, and long tones talking about the different strikers, so sticks, or mallets, or blast sticks, or broomsticks, or brushes. I mean, there's so much you can do, so many different sounds. I mean, if I were to just play, you know, my snare off right now with a brush, with a mallet, with a blast stick, with a drumstick, with my hand, with my words, ba, 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 ba. too many options. And so I highlight that particular pillar sounds because when you are in a creative mode, and we'll get into how we can orchestrate in solos and also in songs, it's just important to know why you have what you have. So I have my stacks because usually I need a short, quick accent. I need something that's going to get in there, be aggressive, and get out of the way immediately. Um, this stack, right by my hi-hat, very easy access. I'm playing stuff on the hi-hat, and then I head over to the stack. If I need to play the stack like a hi-hat, it's in that area, so I can very easily have this head over to my right, access it, and continue grooving symbols in terms of uh, other stacks, again, very long, longer than this one anyway, rattly but aggressive, a lot louder. I use it a lot for accents and being very punchy. Um, if I need an exclamation mark at the end of a drum solo or at the end of a drum fill and I don't want to hit the crashes right away, which kind of open the energy up a little bit, I usually head for that stack. As far as my symbols go for my crash and my ride, I like to have at least two what I like to call clean sounding cymbals. That means when I strike it, there are no rivets, no jingles, no hats, no teddy bears. Nothing is on the cymbal. Just pure, very clean cymbal. 
I like to have two of those because if I need to at least hit, if it's my ride and crash, in this case a 20 and a 22, hitting them together gives me a really open sound, very powerful, big sound. Um, but I also like having something with rivets because every now and again, I might need to do some tapping and I need the sound to last a little bit longer. So here's an example of that with the cymbal. Just a little more character, right? Of course, hi-hats are standard for a lot of the music that I play. And um, they vary in size. Today I chose 14. I've toured with 16, whether they were hi-hats or two crashes. Of course, with the drums, playing them on or off as far as snares go, wood snares, metal snares, knowing the difference, knowing how they feel and how they sound. But what I love about the stage cuts and hip in particular is that your floor tom, and I believe uh, Joe might be asking about toms, so I'll get to your question in a second. Um, specifically, my floor tom has a throw off on it for a snare drum. So, right, can't do that with your regular floor tom. Right? So I'm really, really invested in having a, a, a dual purpose drum in this floor tom position. As you may or may not know, I play with a band called Snarky Puppy, and our sounds are important. Um, having short stacks or cymbals that don't last too long or have a short decay are great to match up with keyboards, match up with any kind of affected horns or anything like that. Um, however, I mentioned tuning, and I'm going to get to your question now, Joe. When it comes to tuning my toms, sometimes I use, we say, notes or pitches, but really it's, uh, it's something like an interval, and it also depends on the size of the drum. Um, there's a song that we use typically in tradition, traditional weddings called Here Comes the Bride. Um, boom, 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 boom. That particular pitch range is what you might use in jazz music. I don't know if that's what I'm working with here. Let's see. Not quite. but. The distance for me is very important. The way I tune my rack tom is I try to get the cleanest tone out of it. So I'm looking to match up all the lugs, make sure they're even. I'll give you a little insight on how each of these lugs sound. And of course, right, generally try to get these happening. This is about a perfect fourth away in terms of the top and bottom head, but I don't always stick to that. Um, if you're curious, there are lots of videos online with tuning, and I know we don't have too much time to get that deep, but the advice I can offer to you is to tune your drums, to detune them and tune them again, detune them and tune them again. It's the practice. You are listening for how a very small 16th turn affects the overall sound. You want to understand that tuning is actually tensioning the drum head. So when you change the tension of one lug or one rod, it affects not only the ones that are nearby, but all the others as well. Another trick and tip that I do, um, I learned from uh, a really good friend of mine, is to actually take your hand and press around the drum to each of the lugs. I'll do that over here for the overhead. Press at each lug, and that actually gives you an opportunity to feel how much tension there is. If it feels very loose, and it's the only one that feels loose, guess what? You're going to have to tighten it up a little bit. Don't crank it, but just start with like maybe 16th or 8th turns, just little by little to make sure that the tension feels relatively the same. Um, for my snare drum, I do like to make sure that the pitch of it is a lot higher and aggressive. Um, and the main reason why is when I turn it off, multifunctioning snares are important. And this functions like a hand drum or a timbali. Um, coming from a Caribbean background, having those kinds of sounds and flavors are really, you know, home to me. And so expressing myself like that is very comfortable, and I want to make sure I have access to that sound. My goodness. 
Questions, this is amazing. Keep them coming, keep them coming. Uh, Richie, I'll quickly ask to answer your question. You said, what kind of cowbell mount do I have? This is the LP cloth. And um, you know, it's a great clamp that I can just throw in my stick bag or in my civil bag along with my cowbell or any other percussion instrument that I have and away I go. Um, mounting them on the drums makes it a lot e easier for me. Um, I'm probably gonna try to see if I can mount some off of cymbal stands and do whatever I can. But this one works for me, so check it out, LP Cloth. Now that we've talked about all of my sounds and the reasons why I have what I have, let's talk about your sounds. Let's talk about what you understand your sound to be. What, why do you have what you have? Um, you might have a drum kit, you might not. You might be trying to figure out what it is that you want to get first. Um, I often, often recommend that people, if you need just one single thing, Start with a snare drum. You know, you can get a lot out of practicing on a snare. So many sounds, so many textures and timbres. Um, you know, you can start working on your brushwork. You can work on your buzz stroke roll. Um, you can work on tuning. You can work on understanding how the mechanics of the drum itself works. And most importantly, when you get your sound together, you can take it with you to a performance when performances happen. Um, but understanding your sound is important. Why do you like what you like? Why do you have what you have? Do you have a favorite record? Maybe it's the Black Album. Maybe you dig Enter Sandman. I don't know, right? <laughs> I had to work that in there somewhere. And if you don't know, do a little Google search. So listen to music. Having sounds amazing, beautiful. Buy everything, if you can. Actually, hold on. Save money first. Understand how money works. Budget, and then buy everything you can. Um, but you have to input sound into your brain. You gotta listen to songs, okay? So here we are, the second pillar, songs. Hmm. And actually, before I get into songs, I want to answer this question from Steve Ashton. The question is, Larnell, you have incredible timing. How did you build your inner click while maintaining such fluid and active playing? And actually, that's a great question that works into this part of what we're going to talk about right now. Internal timing, the clock. We often talk about working on timing with a metronome. Now, yes, please, by all means, Buy one, download the app, whatever you got to do. Go to Google, who knows what they got on there. But listening to songs ultimately helps you with your timing. Because timing is a fluid thing. It's not just working with a click. You put the click on, you can program a beat. It doesn't have life. It doesn't have energy. It doesn't have that sound. Because of what we've experienced with songs, because we've experienced music changing over the years in terms of you know, different genres like rock or funk or jazz or you know, anything from Latin America or the Caribbean, um, anything from around the world, it has what you call a swing to it. It has a certain way that the, the beat just sits in the bar. You know, it's not quite perfect or it's not right on the money. Understanding that is what helped me understand timing. Why? Because it's about compensating. So now we have this click that's happening. The steady metronome, right? One and two and three and four and. Part of what's happening, as you heard with me do with the uh, eighth notes just now, is I'm subdividing. Subdividing internally is great, but if you want to work on your internal time, count out loud. Counting out loud actually confirms where you're putting the beat. You understand where everything is landing, right? And you also know as you're counting, along with a metronome in your ear, if you need to compensate, right? If you need to play faster or slower to make your way to the beat. I'm going to give you a quick tip. Find your favorite record. 
I'm pretty sure if they're not right on a click, or if you're curious about your favorite drummer, they do what I call compensate. They play their beat. It might not feel rushed or, you know, dragging like you might expect or like I just gave that exaggerated example. But what you'll find is a part of their style and their sound is how they compensate. Over a two bar period, you're going to hear them maybe just slightly speed up or slightly slow down. And for them to make it back on the money, right back on that beat, they might have to rush or you know, speed up or slow down just a little bit to compensate, right? Whatever that compensating mechanism is that they use, that's a part of their sound. Study the great musicians and understand the way that they compensate, not only for their own personal style, but for what actually happens in that genre. Songs. Listen to songs. I'll tell you a little story. There was a young man named Larnell. And one day he did not hear a song until he heard it. And then he heard it and they became popular. Eh? You know what I'm talking about? Songs, people. Learn, listen to songs. <laughs> so when you're working with songs, song <laughs> form is the first thing you want to identify. Now, some might say, listen to the bass, listen to the drummer, listen to the lyrics. By all means, go right ahead. But the song has to start and end somewhere. And there are moments in that song and you want to understand what sounds to use in those moments. A moment could be an intro. A moment could be, let's say, I don't know, a bridge, a verse, a pre-chorus, a chorus. There are so many different versions of song form and they all exist through different genres. And it's important to understand what that is. The second you understand song form, you now have your house. You have your structure. You know exactly what you're able to apply to different parts of your song. Now, when I'm looking at a song and I'm trying to figure out how the form goes or I'm listening and I'm you know, actively listening, which is sitting down, undivided attention, no tapping, no playing, no Instagram, no surfing, no, I don't even remember what the term is. I don't know if it's called multi-slacking. When you have multiple pages open and you're just kind of sitting there bouncing between pages. Yeah, none of that. Close your eyes, listen to the music, and follow the journey step by step. I hit play and I listen to the song and I'm identifying, is this an intro? Is this a verse? Okay, sounds like they actually just did a very small four bar intro. We got into the verse. We got into this section, that section, and we kept going. The beautiful part about this now is once you have your form, you get a chance to understand how to add your sounds. So, does that part of the song feel closed? Does it feel like it needs short sounds? Does it feel like it needs long sounds? Does it feel like it needs something that is maybe not as aggressive as a drumstick? Maybe brushes, maybe mallets, maybe you use your hands. Whatever it is, you want to pay attention to the mood of that moment. Another thing, understand what the other musicians are doing. So, it's great to learn the drum part. It might help you more if you learn what the bass player and maybe if there's a keyboard player, what the keyboard player is doing, or even the guitarist, or even understanding what the vocalist is doing and learning lyrics. And I'm going to get to uh, ramming on the drums in a second. I see you have a great question that actually fits with what we're talking about right now. Um, but it's important to just hear those instruments and identify them. Sometimes there might be so much going on, like you listen to James Brown and everyone's so percussive, you can't tell if it's a snare, a hi-hat, a baritone sax, a guitar, a bass, because everyone is so percussive and syncopated. But when you take your time and you really try to find that instrument and you hold on to that instrument, you're starting to develop your ear and your ability to hone in on that sound and follow it all the way through like a kite flying through the woods. You could just see it like a bright red kite. That's where you want to get conceptually. Now to answer your question, and forgive me if I pronounced your name incorrectly, 
uh, Ramon on the drum says, how does your knowledge with keyboards or piano help you in composition or composing a drum part? And that's a great question. So when I learn a song, when I write a song, and I'm creating a drum part, it really depends on where the song started. What was the hook? You know, did it sound like there's a lot of information in there, right? You're hearing the highs and the lows. You're hearing there are some uh, pushes. And forgive me if you don't know that song. I didn't know it either. Um, that's Enter Sandman by Metallica. And what helps for me when I'm composing a drum part is if I'm hearing keys and hearing the harmony, I'm also understanding the progression. So there are chord progressions in music. There are progressions that you hear that indicate that you're going to go to another section or that you're not finished yet or we are absolutely moving on or this is a final moment, right? Chords or harmony or melody or bass lines that move and rest are important to what we do on the drums. When you hear it and you understand it and you can translate it really quickly, you know right away, oh, that feels like a chord progression that is moving. That feels like a chord progression that's heading towards a resting place. You now have options and having options allows you to make decisions. And so to answer your question, it is so helpful when composing a drum part. As far as learning and understanding theory, because I'm able to understand when chords move and they rest. I'm able to understand the energy of the song and not just what I feel, but I can clearly define what's happening from each of the instruments and then appropriately support everything that's happening in the music. Um, Joe Ingalls asks, if I can answer another question, uh, recommended albums for jazz beginners to listen to. Wow. Oh my goodness. Well, um, where can I get you to start? Oh my goodness. Well, let's start with artists. How about that? I'll definitely say if you could listen to some earlier Miles Davis, that'll be great. Um, there's a, a song that I could recommend in particular, if you want to hear some great Tony Williams drumming. Um, the song is called One Finger Snap. I was just listening to the other day. The other day. He does an alter t alternate take as well. Beautiful drum solos on both of those takes from Tony Williams. He's listed as Anthony Williams, but we affectionately call him Tony. Um, I'll answer one more question. Let's see here. I'm going to see what Michael is saying. Michael, you out there? Okay, Michael Balinger, the drummer. Forgive me for pronouncing your name incorrectly. <coughs> Michael asks, um, conceptually, when you improvise a solo over a motif, what are you referring to, thinking to, or referring to or thinking of? Do you make up your own form on top of the actual motif? You repeat and embellish? What's your thought process? That is a great question. It actually leads me into the third pillar, which is soloing. So we've talked a little bit about song form. We've talked quite a bit about sounds. Let's talk about soloing. When I'm playing an open drum solo, as I was before, or if I'm playing it in a song, I'm actually trying to create a song inside of a song. So this feature moment might have a very repetitive loop, which is something that's stable. And it's a great platform for me to actually start building ideas one on top of the other. Now for the listener, you might think I'm playing gibberish, you might not but it's my goal, my aim, to play something that you can translate easily and still give you content, give you information that takes your mind into another place. So, for example, um, if there's a riff that goes one, two, three, four, bump, 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 right? A bump, 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 two, three, four, bump, 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 I hope you're following along. Bump, bump, bump. Cool. I hope you've locked that now. Okay. What I'm going to do as a soloist, I'm going to start doing what's called call and response. But to also help set things up, I'm going to lay down a groove. So, bump, 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 
I said call and response, but do you know what I'm talking about? Let me break it down. The rhythm of the solo section is the first thing you hear. Three, four, boom, 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 and then there's a space. That space is your canvas. That is what's left for you to respond to. Now, boom, 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 respond, respond, boom. Boom, boom. Here to respond. Boom, boom, boom. This is your canvas. Boom, boom, boom. Right? That space is usually what I work with. I just choose that range and I start there. It's small, but it's going to be my foundation. Why? As soon as I'm, as you mentioned, play that motif in that spot or play an idea there. Repeating that idea at least one or two more times makes it a motif, makes it something that the listener can hang on to, is another foundation for me to build on top of. Conceptually speaking, with my solos, I like to build stories or tell stories. Stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I'm often trying to make sure that when I am building my structure, I'm using different sounds, either repeatedly or you know, using maybe the drums only, or maybe starting off on the cymbals, or staying to the hi-hat and the snare, because in the beginning of this story, I want it to sound a little more tight, a little more closed, which means, and you can put it in the comments, I'm probably gonna use, and maybe, and maybe, and definitely, right, as of my shorter sounds. When I start to open things up and introduce, as I like to call them, new characters, I get into opening things up, like maybe hitting a crash on a downbeat. Maybe I'm gonna be hitting a crash on an upbeat. Either way, I'm trying to now, as you mentioned, use motifs and build a song inside of a song. So I'm now creating a structure, but I'm also creating levels. I have level one where it's related to the groove. Level two where it's still the groove, but I'm starting to break away the snare drum is not always on the backbeat, right? Boom, boom, boom. I might change it up. Boom, 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 boom. Level three, I start to expand a little more. I'm opening up to my wider sounds, my longer tones, using maybe buzz rolls on the snare to have something that sounds a little more exaggerated or has a longer tail on it. I might do cymbal swells. I might hit the crashes. I might hit both of my open, clean cymbals. Um, not always relying on the stacks until I'm ready for level three, the end of level three, where I'm starting to now grow and explode. This is where I'm starting to now play a lot of really interesting ideas. I'm, you know, I'm using the ideas that require me to move my arms around, you know, the wax on, wax off. Right? And of course, you know, maybe going across the kit like this, some visual effects. Level four, which is really the last quadrant or the last part of the solo, I'm starting to create something that's kind of like a puzzle piece. So using more syncopations that are recognizable, using sounds that are a little more stable, landing on beats that are more um, related to the song, maybe even playing a rhythm that's related to the song. And that actually allows my spaceship to reconnect to the main docking station, right? Or it allows me to connect with the band, and you might get an idea or a sound, you know, boom, 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 two, three, four, and in, right? Very, very important to have a setup that gets you out of your section. So to recap, level one, groove it out. Level two, start to expand. Level three, now you can insert some fireworks. And of course, level four, bring it home, right? We're pedaling a little bit slower. You could keep the energy, but you wanna make sure you have something that relates to the song so you have a very smooth transition back into the music. Sounds, songs, soloing. Those three pillars are how I have organized myself behind the drums. 
I've taken my time, you know, to understand why I use these sounds, to understand song form, and also to organize my ideas and my thoughts so that when I sit down and solo, I can play freely. Why? Because I don't have to do level one, two, three, four. I could do level one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, level one, two, you know? And sometimes it's just level one because you don't have much time. Either way, identifying what kind of space you're going to fill, identifying the sounds that you have and how you're going to use them, and of course identifying the song structure and form so that you can do something that's appropriate to the music and you can support the song. All right? I'm going to hop over to my question board here and see if I can uh, connect with y'all a little bit. So Valdex, if I pronounce your name right, hopefully. The question is, Larnell, your drumming can be categorized as a busy, or as busy, but a good type of busy. How do you decide when to step back and simplify things or go nuts? I'm glad you think I go nuts. I'd like to think I go nuts as well. Um, so the way that I would answer that question is, first of all, if you're not quite sure what this question is asking, it's actually asking about, it's talking about activity on the drums. It's talking about how active I am. And for the type of activity that I like to do, sometimes people are very active and it doesn't feel good for the music. Sometimes people are very active and it fits perfectly with the music. It comes to understanding the void that you're filling. And this is actually something that I come to understand that Quincy Jones does quite often when he's composing and arranging. He thinks about density. He thinks about the musical moment and trying to understand how much sound is actually happening at that time. Can I insert another instrument that will complement or will it actually break this whole entire structure you know, and have it falling like a house of cards? When I'm active on the drums, I'm waiting to see what others are doing and listening to their train of thought. I kind of like thinking of the role of a drummer as being a host. You're paying attention to what's happening in the kitchen. You're like, hey, how you doing, everybody? You need more drinks? You need some more food? Okay, cool. You know, you go to the back patio. Hey, how are the burgers coming? You know, I make sure you on the other grill for the, the veggie burgers, man. Like, I don't want you contaminating and, and doing the wrong thing. And of course, you know, people are coming through the front door and you're trying to make sure you understand what's happening there. It's a party. It's chaos. It's a lot of different minds inputting their thoughts all together. However, if everyone is listening, it is so much easier to improvise that conversation, to improvise the moment, to move smoothly from the front of the house to the back to actually play musical ideas that are relevant. And my activity, when I am very active, I'm trying my best to be relevant to the musical moment. I also am looking at the density and trying to say, hmm, I was really active at this point. Maybe it's time for someone else to be active. Maybe I can just leave a little bit of space and open it up for someone to insert their ideas and maybe to change the flow of the conversation. Why? Because it ain't all about this guy, right? So that is one thing that I like to do, and I really hope that answered your question. I'll take another one. This is Fabrizio del Castillo. Um, Larnell, can you also talk about the different sounds and colors that you can achieve playing on the ride cymbal? Thank you. Great question. So I will admit, as I mentioned before, I am not a know-it-all, but I'm here to share what I got. Um, when it comes to the ride symbol, organizing yourself on the ride symbol is understanding what the ride symbol can do sound-wise. Um, Jeff Tain Watts put it beautifully, and he said, between the bell and the edge of your ride symbol, it's a series of tones. And as you make your way from the bell all the way towards the outer side of the symbol, you should be hearing different tones, and it should sound like a scale. Let's give it a try and see what happens. A 
Lots of options here. However, it's also in the hand. You don't want to choke the stick. You want to make sure your form is relaxed. I've seen Benny Greb do this a couple times, where he just has his hands to the side, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. You know, put your phone down for a second and wiggle your arms. Come on. All right? Don't be silly or be silly, whatever. Just wiggle your arms. Trust me. You do that, and it's also great for photos as well if you want to relax. <sighs> Take a deep breath and let it out. Then you raise your arms, and that actually puts you to, in this beautiful, relaxed tone, attitude, moment, headspace, right? You've kind of shed as much of the static electricity as you can, and your arms are maybe a little bit tired. So when you're done flapping around, just grab your sticks, and you're ready to start working on just relaxed form. Same goes for the ride symbol. You want to make sure you're not choking on the stick because this striker needs to resonate if you want to get the sound out of the cymbal and the drums. Um, different sounds that I can get out of the ride cymbal. Some people talk about what's called shading. Now again, this is where I show a bit of my ignorance, but I'm going to share the term with you and hope that we can all just do some homework together. Huh? And actually, if you're seeing this after the fact or right now, maybe just put in the comments what you know about shading. What I know about shading is that with the tip of the stick, depending on the type of tip you're using, right now this is something similar to an acorn tip. As I'm playing, if you can see this, right, it's a bit flatter here and obviously on the tip, it's a little bit narrower. So obviously when you're playing, the contact that the stick makes with the surface, it's going to be a little bit wider if the tip is, you know, a bit larger. And, or the side of it, I should say, if it's a barrel tip or an acorn tip or, you know, um, a little bit different for a ball tip, but at the same time, you can still get some attitude and I'll explain how. Um, shading, from what I understand, and I'm exaggerating, has a lot to do with the surface of the tip of the stick and where you are playing on the ride cymbal. So you can angle your stick a particular way and you can also lean into it. Um, that is definitely one way I do get some sounds out. I don't recommend just playing like this, right? We don't want to do that because your elbow's out, you're looking like a chicken wing, and you're going to be getting repetitive stress syndrome, your shoulders, it could be hundreds of dollars in repairs, and before you know it, you're at the body shop, the actual body shop, trying to figure out what's wrong with your arm, you need a you know, bionic arm, and who knows, right? You've got to figure it out. It's 2021. So, playing the ride cymbal. I really believe that, um, you know, like the drums, you can get a lot of energy out of the drums with relaxed form. Um, if I could sidestep that question, think about your arm as motors, right? Having multiple motors, where you have this big gear here, or motor, you have at your elbow, so that's your shoulder is the biggest one, your elbow is medium, right? Your wrist is small, then you have your fingers, which are micro. Now, managing the stick, getting a really good fulcrum where you have that cross that you're creating with your hand. Some people believe in a fulcrum hanging off the middle finger, which actually opens up the stick a little bit more. I believe Dave Weckl and Freddie Gruber are into that type of technique and others. I use that for myself as well if I feel like there's a bit of stress on my wrists. Um, but the thing that I want to highlight with the stick is outside of controlling with the pads of your fingers on the stick or how much energy you have with your wrist or what you're doing with your forearm connected to your elbow and then of course with your shoulder providing a lot of that energy. I'm giving you game right now, okay? This is like pro tip number one, saved my life seven years ago. Imagine a beam of light at the tip of the stick, okay? Now imagine that beam of light going to the middle of the stick. Now imagine it going back to the tip. Now imagine it sitting right in this area near the shoulder. If you imagine a light of a ball of energy or light right here, and you think about striking the drum with this part of the drumstick, you actually get a lot of energy out of the drum without too much work. And the reason why I recommend that is it actually changes the way that you strike the drum, as in the way that you hold the stick the way that you throw the drumstick at the head, right? 
you're no, now no longer trying to aim at the tip of the stick, which causes you to have a lot of wrist motion. You're aiming with kind of like that shoulder, which gets you now thrusting the stick at the drum and supporting it and putting more girth. I guarantee if you do that, you're gonna pull lower frequencies out of your drums and you're actually gonna reduce the amount of stress that you put on your body. So I put that same information, that same idea and concept into playing the ride cymbal as well. Evan Ferguson, good to see you in the chat, buddy. I hope you're still around and I'm gonna to get to this question. Um, Evan's a great drummer, we went to school together. Uh, the question is, do you ever experience the complexity of your ideas being above your ability when performing or practicing performing? And how do you or would you approach regulating this to encourage uh, fluid expression? Wow, that's an amazing question. So let me try and break this down a little bit. We're talking about ideas and complex ideas when I'm performing or practicing to perform. And I guess you said, uh, do I have experienced the complexity of my ideas being above my ability, right? Um, yes, I do. And when I experience that, I know that it is absolutely gas to fuel me to where I wanna go. That means I have a new column to make on my practice list, getting organized, right? If I ever see a limit, which is I have an idea, and it cannot exist, I cannot put it into fruition or manifest it on the drums, that just means I have a new list of things to work out. So, of course, absolutely, because that's the way I drive myself and push myself beyond my limits to create. Now, um, you're, the other part of your question is, uh, how would I, or so how do I or would I approach regulating this to encourage fluid expression? So. I guess regulating, I don't know if I would use the word regulate, but my approach to using that for fluid expression is really understanding what it is that I'm trying to get out, which starts with beatboxing. So to organize yourselves, here's a bit of homework. If you've got a phone, you're on your phone, clear out those photos. I don't think you need all those memes and stuff you're holding. Get a Google Drive or something and store them there and you can upload later. This is about you and investing in you and organizing your practice time. Got it? Good. Take your phone, and maybe if you have a computer as well, have the computer play a song that you want to play to. Take your phone, record yourself singing your drum ideas or beatboxing your drum ideas. The voices I've learned recently from Tana Alexa, who is an amazing vocalist and has actually performed with Antonio Sanchez's band Migration, um, and actually, she has her, her um, own amazing project. Congratulations again, Tana Alexa, for your Grammy nomination this year for Best Jazz Vocal Album of the Year. And so what she said in the clinic she did for her college was that the voice is an invisible instrument. It's the one instrument that we cannot see, but it is connected to us, and we can express ourselves with it as long as we learn how to shape vowels, sounds, and really just connect our ideas and vocalize them. So. The way I get through it is I vocalize my ideas. I sing them. As you hear me beatboxing as we're hanging right now, I sing as much as I can. I put as much as I can out into the air. I record it, and then I try to play it. I try to learn from myself. So that's what I do. But that's a great question, man. Thank you. Um, D Brown on the one. All right. I think I know who that is, so I'm going to say what's up. Hey, Larnell, have you ever struggled musically on a gig? If so, how did you overcome it? Can we take a moment of silence for all the gigs where I screwed up? <laughs> or if you want, you can put F in the chat. Totally, please do it. Um, what I would say to answer that question, yes, I've struggled, absolutely. How did I overcome it? On gigs, I would record my gigs. Good or bad, on the way home, I'm listening to that performance. The struggle, however, was not so much in my technical ability or in what I was able to do on the drums and how I was able to communicate my ideas or communicate with the other musicians or even play the song form. The struggle was mentally. So musically is actually mentally because that's where the music is coming from. 
and I struggled. What I would find is I'd be on a performance and I would not feel good about what I was about to do and I would choose something else that I didn't want to do, which was a drum fill that I hated. And, you know, I was just like, this is terrible. What am I going to do? Get organized. The first thing is I'd record those gigs. Second, I would listen to them and I would understand the drum fills that I was doing that I didn't want to do. I would learn how to replace those because I was understanding the moments that I was creating or the moments and gaps I was trying to fill and I would just kind of remove that drum fill and insert it with something else that I felt represented what I wanted to do at the moment. Again, beatboxing the ideas. The mental part of the struggle was that I was not able to n understand what I wanted to do. So making better decisions in real time. What I did was I actually spent time recategorizing my bag of drum fills. So I would learn language, I would learn fills, I would lift drum fills, I would check out records, I would watch drummers online, you know, figure things out, talk to other people, hang out over the phone, hang out in person, which is what we were doing a lot before all this craziness, and trade ideas. But ultimately, once I figured out an idea, even though I thought about it as like right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, or kick, snare, kick, snare, kick, snare. I'm not thinking that way when I'm playing the drums in real time. I'm thinking boom, bap, boom, bap, boom, bap, I'm thinking in the way that I'm singing right now. And that's the kind of headspace I'm in when I'm performing. So when I'm practicing, I need to practice my ideas, not only thinking about the technical, but I also need to, need to make my funny sounds and sing my ideas because I know that's the only way I'm going to remember or translate in my bag what's there to the drum kit in the musical moment. Um, and then, of course, the other mental side is the confidence. I often would have what's called imposter syndrome, where I would show up to a gig and not understand why I was called. Did not understand what they wanted from me. And I had to pep, pep talk myself almost every gig for a certain period and season of my life. And what I did was I said, they called you for a reason. They called you because they saw something in you that was natural. You have an ability, you have an instinct. You make decisions. The decisions that you make, they like the way that you make decisions. All of these decision-making ideas that you have, that is your musical sound. Your sound, they want. They also know that you do your homework. You learn songs. You listen to them, you study if you don't know the genre, you ask questions if you need help. So they believe in my work ethic. So if they like my instincts, they like my work ethic, they like me. And once I started to do that prep work for myself and really calm my mind down and understand that I'm here for a purpose, I'm here to share, I'm here to play, I'm here to do the thing, that really helped my music because now all the chatter, all the static electricity that's really noisy, all this stuff that's in my head, dissipated, gone, cleared, evaporated, right? Now it's just me and the music. And we can dance in the circle, we can, you know, run around in slow-mo, we can pretend that it's like, you know, whatever funny movie you enjoy, and you can now hit that flow state, right? So that is what I would recommend. Uh, I know we don't have too much time. I'm going to take a few more questions. I see Max. What's happening, Max? I'm going to hit your question here. Um, Max Kleftinger, Klefting, Kleftinger, forgive me for messing up your name, drums. Hey, Larnell, huge, huge fan. Appreciate it. Um, and my part said matter, Max. Forgive me. I'm starting to teach. Do you have any tips for beginner teachers? Yes, yes, I do. Um, being a musician, a drummer that started at two years old, growing up in a family of musicians and the lineage going back to my great grandfather, music being something that was very easy for me to do, I still had to understand and learn the practice of music, the practice of playing, understanding musical moments. As a teacher, I also worked with young musicians that were as young as four years old. And what I found worked 
for the interaction was to understand how to teach language of drumming or music or ideas, basic concepts, but keeping the fun in it. As a teacher, we're here to motivate. We're also here to share and break down information. As Mike Johnston mentions often, with this stick, we are all on this journey together. We start at the same place. We're all beginners at some point. And at the end here is the greatest drummer that ever lived that you believe is the greatest drummer that ever lived. This journey right now, we are all on this middle passage together. And there will be things that we experience in the beginning of our careers that we can break down for somebody and help them get through those challenges. So as a teacher that's beginning, I would say understand your journey through music making. Maybe even write it down. Have those notes and know how you started. Know where you began. Know what kept you in the game, kept you going, kept you encouraged. And then take that information and see if you can learn and understand what keeps this young musician going, what keeps them encouraged, what keeps them you know, engaged. And continue to insert those moments as you teach them information. Because the technique takes discipline, right? But discipline is a practice, and sometimes you need encouragement. And so when you can figure out how to encourage that young musician to stay disciplined, to stay locked, to see long term, to see short term, to see gains, beautiful thing. Last thing I'll also say is have a few things that can change their playing immediately. Short goals, quick changes, they will feel pumped. They'll understand, and even if they don't continue learning with you, you would have changed something about their playing for the better. I hope that helps. Grant, Grant says, student, okay. Um, the question is, I've received, or, sorry, I recently, I've recently started a band. Congratulations. What is the most important thing to keep in mind when preparing for gigs? Okay, great question. And what I would say is, the most important thing to remember when you're playing gigs is that you are not there just to play by yourself as a band. You could do that in your basement. You could do that in a practice space. You are there to play for the people that are coming to watch you. So it's very important to keep in mind that there are people here who have paid money, who have spent their time and their money to see you do what you do. And even if they only showed up for another artist in your opening or it's a showcase, they are probably going to stay. So remember that you have an audience. Also, remember that you have a style and a sound. Identify what that is, identify what makes you different, sets you apart from everyone else, and really boost those features. I guarantee it will allow you to feel more invested in your sound, your approach, your image. That's another thing as well. And the last thing I'll say is music business. It's a business, so understand business. Register yourselves as a business. And if you're writing songs together, make sure you make an agreement before you write the songs. Are you all gonna split their percentages very you know, equally? Is one person gonna be the sole writer of a song and they bring it to the band to arrange? Understand your rights as a songwriter and register your songs with SoCan if you're here in Canada. Um, Ignatius de, uh, de Pedro, I hope I said your name correctly, um, what separates good drummers and great drummers? What kind of techniques do great drummers use to get that extra level of finesse? What separates good drummers and great drummers is an understanding of textures in sound, right? Understanding what is appropriate. I'll even put it to you and say, what makes a great conversationalist versus a good conversationalist, right? You're having a conversation. It's an exchange back and forth of information and ideas. And we're communicating with a language through words. So if somebody can continue to encourage and propel conversation and leave you feeling positive at the end of it all, I'd say they did a pretty good job. As a drummer, the greats, I find that their ghost notes are at a great volume. When I say great, their height is maybe about two inches to like about an inch off the snare. I feel like their sound is assertive, which means when they hit the toms, they're getting a great tone. Um, tone, just in general, is what great drummers have. 
an understanding of kit balance. For different genres, the balance of the sounds are going to be different. There might be more emphasis on cymbals in one genre, maybe like a certain era of jazz, versus like an emphasis on the kick and snare, or even placing the emphasis on the downbeat, like in funk with James Brown. Um, I'm seeing a familiar name here. I'm going to jump to that question in a second. I'll take the first one up top. But this is the Space Time Unwind. Question is, hey Larnell, have you ever needed to practice keeping your drummer face under control? Good question. Now that I am constantly masked, I'm definitely going to have to practice because my facial expressions under this doggone thing right here, they're terrible. <laughs> so, um, Keeping it under control, however, I wouldn't use that term. What I would quickly say is understanding that I'm expressing myself and that I'm making eye contact with people. So not just staring into the abyss, but actually looking at them and connecting. You know, if I want to go, or, or, and they kind of get that face too, and we're both bobbing, you know, and it's kind of like Night at the Roxbury's, like that whole double head thing, right? You're creating energy. And so working on the drummer face is a plus, is a must. Controlling it, I think if people start feeling afraid because you're kind of giving them the darting stare, I'd say it's time to work on it. Topher Scott, good to see you. Um, the question is, do you have any insight into the relationship between a drummer and a musical director? Like on a gig, like the Quincy Jones gig that I played a few years ago? Absolutely great question. Um, what I would say as far as the relationship with the mu musical director, it is so important to connect with your band leader, musical director, artist, arranger. As the drummer, you are there to serve. Your sounds matter. So when you connect with your musical director, have an understanding of what it is that they are looking for from you. Understand when you talk to them, what do they need energy-wise? Because Usually, it's only one drummer. For the Quincy Jones gigs, Quincy Jones gigs, I was the only drummer. There was percussionists. There was uh, like 30 to 40 piece orchestra. There was a rhythm section. There were about five background vocalists and the lead singers as well, plus a conductor and sometimes Quincy would conduct. And so you got to understand that the drummer is holding kind of like, you know, is the wrapper, is the cellophane wrapper or the, 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 the packaging to this complete sound. So between you and the musical director, you're both in control of the flow. Eye contact is a must. Understanding flow and the way that they count in the air, right? If they are more classically trained, where does their downbeat fall amongst this count, right? One, two, three, one, two, three. Like sometimes they're doing this and I'm like, where is your one boss, right? have that conversation. Understand what their cues mean. What is this? What's this? You know, they're doing all these pitcher cues and you're just looking at them just like, uh, I saw it on a Yankees game, but I'm not quite sure what that's supposed to mean. Know the cues. Have an understanding. Have a conversation. Talk about the flow and understand that you're both there to support the band. Everyone's there to support the music, but because you have a very specific role as a drummer, have that conversation, and have a good relationship with them. I'm going to take one more question, and I think we're going to be wrapped at that point. I believe so. Yes? Yeah, OK. Um, let's see here. Oh my gosh, these are so many, so many great, great questions. Um, OK, I'll take these last three. OK, cool. I'll start with Joe Ingalls. OK, cool. Joe, hope you're well. Hope you're still here. Larnell, how long should high school students practice? How long did you practice each day in high school? Great question. Three hours a day is what I did every day. My schedule, because I had to get organized. I'd come home from school. This was middle school, actually. Come home from school, practice from 3 to 6. Then I would actually watch a show called Bravo Jazz from 6 to 7. And then I did my homework for the rest of the night. Unless I had a basketball game that day, um, that was my routine. So I had practice time, I had music input, and then I had time to do something else and do my work. Uh, I would recommend that if young musicians are practicing for long periods of time, you also understand how to massage your body and to release the stress. 
Do not practice and run away. Yes, you're young, but you will not be young forever. So please take care of your body. Um, uh, Z lemons or Z lemons, depending on where you're from. I'm late 40s, just starting out. I'm 37, so I'm heading towards you, man. Um, I am I too old to be good? I know never too old to start, but will I be able to be competent? I believe so, yes. Why? Because it's about understanding the way that you learn music, understanding the way that you learn, understanding the type of intelligence that you have, um, whether it's spatial, whether it's music, whether it's you know, sound-based, whatever it is, um, you know, speech-based. There are so many different intelligences out there and once you know how you absorb information, you have the key to your learning. I say there's no better time than now to get into drumming, no better time than now to learn and understand yourself, especially with the climate that we're in in these days. There are so many changes happening, and I do believe that we can all take a step back, understand how we learn, and make the necessary changes so we can have a better, stronger community overall. And of course, from Jeremy, last question here. Um, the rhythm section community, to be specific, tips for locking with the bass player. Here's a tip. Don't be a little sibling, right? If they're playing something, you don't always have to copy what they're doing. You want to complement what they're doing. Understanding that in music, with a bass guitar, you first want to know, if you want to lock with them, you want to know what they're doing. Second of all, you want to listen to records and understand what albums and records they've listened to and songs, or check out the same Spotify playlists. Whatever encourages you or inspires you to make music, be on the same wavelength to a degree. You're having a conversation. If they play something that you recognize, you might be, if you're in a situation where you can be a little freer with how you improvise, you can actually start to play the, play the drum beat to the thing that they're playing on the bass. And now you're both smiling, you're both giddy, now you're both doing the swinging, you know, the hills are alive, slow motion dance. Whatever it is that you want to do that makes you happy. At the end of the day, it is about that energy, it is about understanding each other and knowing the music. Another thing that would be great is if you're working with a very experienced bass player, even if they're not experienced that much, but they have some kind of playing experience live or with different drummers, ask them, what is it that they like about the drums and that works with them? And then, you know, you could also let them what you know what you like about the bass. Understand each other's preferences. You're building this relationship. You want to get to know each other. Know the likes and dislikes. Know, you know, understand that you maybe play a little ahead or behind the beat. Find out if they play ahead or behind the, the beat. Understand all those little intricacies and nuances. And to me, that will allow you together to get organized to have the best sound possible. I just want to thank Logan McQuaid for this opportunity. I want to thank Yamaha for always being supportive, um, as well as Zildjian, Promark, Evans, Latin Percussion, and Prologic stick pads. Y'all are the best. You've been behind me for a very long time, and to those that have been new to my team, thank you so much. I also want to give a shout out to my team um, who's been helping me to, to get things out there, like uh, my new merch, my t-shirts. You can head to my website, just hit the little tab that says store, go to apparel, and you can see my t-shirts that say, I'll take more volume, please. Um, that's from the quick catchphrase from the viral video that happened recently. Enter Sandman, this guy learns Enter Sandman. Yes, I learned it on the spot. No, I did not know it before. I live in Toronto, not a Tupperware container. Okay, I promise you, I'm a real individual. And um, I had to make a shirt because I thought it was so funny, the reaction. So if you dig it, we got t-shirts, we got sweaters, hoodies, long sleeves, do it, all right? And also, I have an album, which is where that first track was from, called Relive the Moment. That's available on CD. It's available on vinyl as well for those audio files out there. And if you don't have a record player, and uh, like most people, you don't have a CD player, you can still get MP3s and, and uh, WAV files off the website, or you can also find the album on your favorite streaming platform. 
I believe that's my time. I want to thank you all for your amazing questions. Uh, thank you so much for being and hanging in the chat. I want to send tons of love to you. I know it's a very difficult time, but we're pivoting. We're doing what we can. We're making the most of the time. And I hope that you can make the most of the time by getting organized behind the drums. Peace.